Thanks. I'll begin with a word of prayer. So. Heavenly Father, we uh, thank you uh, for this day. I thank you for the students. Again, Lord, I just pray that you bless this class, Lord, today as we uh, study your creation. In your name I pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. So, um, mostly uh, pretty good effort on the homework. Uh, a few of you could work harder, but, you know, nothing terribly surprising there. Um, so, lecture seven talking to you guys about subgroups and cyclic groups. So <clears throat> I'll start out with this theorem. H uh, subset of G, a group, all right, is a subgroup, right? And remember we wrote H less than or equal to G to denote that. Um, if and only if the following three conditions are satisfied. Number one, um, one in G is an element H, the identity of the group is an H. Two, if um, let's say x comma y are in h, then x, y is an element of h. So we say that h is closed. Not to be confused with the topological sense of closed. Three, although that confusion is fairly unlikely for most students in here, um, if um, x is an element of h, then x inverse is an element of h where x x inverse equals to 1g equals to x inverse x. <coughs> so what I'm saying here, what am I saying here basically? x inverse is the inverse what? It's the inverse of x and g, right? Because it multiplies by x on the left and right to give back the identity in, in g. So it's the inverse in g. It's kind of a subtle point, but I'm trying to say that the inverse um, of an element in h is in fact, th like there's no separate idea of inverse for the subset. It's the same inverse for the for the whole group is for the subset. <clears throat> okay, so how do you prove this? So this is if and only if, right? So let me just talk about this direction to start with. Um, if H is a subgroup of G, right? Then what's that mean by definition? H <laughs> is a group, right, with respect to the operations of G, right? Restricted to H. Restricted to H, yeah. With respect to the operations of G, right? Um, so, <clears throat> what does that mean? We get 2 and 3 pretty much for free, right? However, what's left to show? However, we should show that the identity in H is the same as the identity in G, and we should show that the inverse that exists in H is the same as the inverse in G, right? Both of these things follow from cancellation and a short argument. So like here, we have the identity in H, right, times the identity in H is equal to the identity in H, right? But that's also equal to 
the identity in H times the identity in G, yeah? Because the identity in H is still an element of the group. So multiplying by the identity of the group still gives me back the element again. But then by cancellation, that says what? 1H equals to 1G, right? So there you go. The identity in H must be the identity in G. And also if we have that X, um, X is an element of H and X inverse is an element of H such that what? X, X inverse is equal to 1H, right? Is equal to X inverse X. Well, this is also, I mean, I mean, if you let me work in the middle here, this is 1G, right? So what's that mean? X inverse is also the inverse in G. Because it satisfies the needed condition to be an inverse in G. Because that's the forward implication of the proof. How about the reverse implication? How about the other direction? So in other words, assume 1, 2, and 3 hold. For some subset of a group G, then we almost have, right, that H is a subgroup of G. We just lack what? What is the only thing we lack? I mean, this says that there's an <clears throat> this says that there's an identity, right? Because this is still true. <laughs> um, I mean, there's an identity. It's closed. It's closed under inverse, right? Associativity, right? So that's easy to prove, though. Um, consider if we have x, y, z, and h, which is a subset of G then X, Y, Z are where? They're in G, right? So X, Y, Z is equal to X, Y, Z. There, thus, H is a subgroup of G. Okay, so that's the subgroup test. I showed you one, one example of that last time, right? We can prove that SLN is a subgroup of GLN. I'll go on here. Um, example one, uh, if N is greater than or equal to zero, we can define NZ to be multiples of N. So that's and k such that uh, k is an integer, right? So we can show that that's a subgroup of the integers without too much trouble, right? Oh well, I tried. So first of all, zero, um, well n times zero is equal to zero, right? I'm sorry, let me get to the yeah, and of course, um, 0 plus x is equal to x is equal to 0 plus x for all x and z, right? I mean, <clears throat> why am I, I'm sorry, I, this, is, this is dumb. Let me, uh, let me just be brief. No need for saying that. Thus, what? Zero is in NZ, right? That's number one. The identity is in, is in NZ. So we're thinking of NZ as H. When you guys are so quiet, it makes me nervous. Let's see here. Uh, number two, so that's one. Two, if we have X and Y are in NZ, <laughs> then there exists K and J in the integers such that what? and k and y equals 2 and j, right? Thus, 
where then uh, x plus y is what? Right. But what's k plus j? It is integer, right? So this is an element of nz as k plus j is an integer, right? Um, also, how about minus x? The negative of x. This is minus nk, right? Watch this. Really complicated. This is n times minus k. And that's an element of nz as minus k is an integer, right? So there you go. One, two, three, subgroup. Hence, nz is a subgroup of z, additively, obviously, um, by subgroup test theorem. I usually refer to this as the subgroup test theorem. All right. Yep. Yep. It does matter. Why does it matter? Right. So, in, so we have to understand the theorem in context for an additive group. You know, I mean, that's a great question. Uh, El Presidente, um, because this in an additive context is, is zero in H, right? Find zero sub G if you want me to be. Um, here, this becomes X plus Y is in H, and this becomes minus X in H again in the additive notation. Yeah. Okay, now... Um, along here. There's also theorem 2. And this is, we're going to see, the, the argument for theorem 2, it's like, we've seen this before. It's the same argument again. Finite subgroup test. And this is super nice because it says if you've got a finite subset of a group, the group doesn't have to be finite, but if the subset's finite, if H is finite subset of group G, um, then H is a subgroup of G uh, if and only if H is closed under the group operation. Well, let's just say H is closed so we don't have to keep saying under the group operation. When we say H is closed, it's understood that's under the group operation, all right? In other words, criteria two is met for H in the previous theorem. Okay, so let's see here. The forward implication of this is duh. All right, so the, I mean, if H is a subgroup, it's closed. This is part of the definition of a group. What's that? Well, if you're wrong, it may result in negative partial credit, though. So it's, yeah, something I'm experimenting with in Math 450 this semester. You can get a score between minus 8 and 16 for a quiz, which your target's 10 points. If you answer all the problems wrong, you could have got a minus 8 in last week's quiz. I'm not, I haven't graded them yet. I'm not sure what happened, but we'll see. Um, so let's suppose H is closed, right? And um, H is finite, right? So suppose this is equal to N, right? Less than infinity, finite. Um, if, um, if we let X be an element of H, then notice that x, x squared, x cubed, and so forth and so on, by closure, are what? These are, again, 
in H by closure, right? Because the product of X with X is a product of things in H, which must again be in H, right? Yet H is finite. So eventually this list has to repeat. And so by finiteness of H, um, there exists M and N um, such that what? X to the N is equal to X to the N plus M. <coughs> By cancellation and laws of exponents, what's this give us? So then what? What did you say, King? Oh, very, very good. Uh, so immediately we get number one, right? Hence one is true. One is an element of H. This marker is a bad choice. Also, how about this? X times X to the M minus one is equal to one which of course is also equal to x to the m minus one times x, right? Which says that x inverse is equal to x to the m minus one, an element of h, right? We assumed two, so we got one, we got two, we got three. We have subgroup. Right. A, yeah. I believe that's known as closing the proof with a Fonzie. Let's see here. A. <laughs> Okay, sorry, is that before you guys' time? I think it's before my time. Maybe Dr. Sprano, I don't know. So this is the finite subgroup test, which is super nice and useful because you don't have to check for inverses. You just check closure, you're good to go, right? So the short version of this proof is just that closure for finite H implies existence of inverses for H, and hence one is an H. We already assumed. Two. Right. So I'm, I'm again. I to be more. This therefore, I'm saying by the subgroup test theorem over there. Okay. I just didn't write it out. So an example I should give you guys. Um, example. I guess for me it's example two. It might be whatever. I don't know. So here. We talked about this guy last time, the Klein 4 group, right? It's um, 1, A, B, and C, right? Where, what were the rules? A squared equals to B squared equals to C squared equals to 1. And the product of any two of these is the other one, right? So like A, B is C, B, C is A, C, A is B, right? It's commutative as well. It's the Klein 4 group. Um, so, with the finite subgroup test theorem, it's really, I mean, anyway, this is kind of dumb. It's easy to see these are subgroups anyway, you know. But certainly, we could take H1 equal to the set containing 1A. Um, why is this a subgroup? Well, it's a subset of K4, right? Um, which we argued was a group last time. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's closed because A times A is 1 again. So there you go. By this theorem, subgroup. H2, 1B, H3, 1C. Uh, these are your subgroups. If you want to put them in order, it looks like this. We've got 1, and then we've got like H1, H2, H3, and then we've got, we've got K4 itself. These are, these are the possible subgroups of K4. Right. I would point out, in my view, H1, H2, and H3, these are kind of the interesting ones, right? And the reason I say that, these are the interesting subgroups, one, interesting subgroups is because 1 and K4 are always with us. You give me a group, 
any group if you like, I can tell you two subgroups automatically. The group itself and the set just containing the identity, the singleton containing the identity. These are automatically subgroups of any group. Okay? Um, so <laughs> that brings us to our next sort of organizing idea, which is a lattice diagram. So we can talk about the lattice of subgroups. And so what this is, is a picture for a finite group, which helps us, I mean, I guess you could do them for infinite groups, I don't know. Actually, I really don't know. Um, I'm not saying that as like a, something people say all the time, I don't know, when they really know, right? Like when I say I don't know about that, I mean, I really don't know. <laughs> but this, um, traditionally, we write the group at the top, and then you just draw lines, like so. So here you'd have, um, say, H1, H2, H3, and then the set just containing one down here. So in this diagram, what this, what this right here indicates is that uh, H3 is a subgroup of K4, okay? This, this guy right here indicates that 1 is a subgroup of H3. Right. Not especially exciting, but there it is. <coughs> Example three. So you're saying you don't know whether we can always form a lattice diagram for... Oh, we can always form a lattice diagram for a finite group. Oh, okay. I just don't know what to do for an infinite group. I mean, I can... I have some ideas for infinite groups, but... <laughs> yeah. I'm just saying, this is something we do for finite groups. Okay. I maybe... Well, I... I don't know why I opened the can of worms. Let me just close it. <laughs> Z4. Can of worms is closed under this lecture. Under this, uh, for this lecture, yes. Okay, so C4 um, seems dangerous. Let's see here. This is 1A, A squared, A cubed, right? So we can look at different sets, subsets of this, and see if they're closed, right? So such that what? This is the cyclic group of order four, so a to the fourth is one. <laughs> okay? So, I mean, we still have one and C4 as stupid subgroups of C4, right? Fine. How about, what about this? If we look at h equal to one, I'll say h1, one equal to one comma a squared, right? Notice that a squared times a squared is what? It's one again, right? So this H1 is closed, right? So therefore H1 is a subgroup of C4, okay? Are there any other subgroups? What if we tried to make H2 to be, say, one and, and um, include A in it? What then happens if you include A in it? Right, once you have A, this, whether you like it or not, creates A squared, and, and then, whether you like it or not, these two create A cubed, and all of a sudden, you're to C4, right? On the other hand, what if you just tried to say, oh, well, fine, fine, well, I, I'll, just, I'll just, I won't include A, I'm going to include A cubed, haha, -ha, joke's on you. Well, no, unfortunately, A cubed times A cubed is what? A cubed, A cubed, otherwise known as? A squared, oh man, and then once you have this and that, you get A to the fifth, which is also known as A. So you see, so that's it. We either get the identity subgroup, or this subgroup containing two elements, or the whole group. That's, that's all, those are all the possible subgroups, right? Any subgroup has to be a finite subset, so we can tell whether or not it's a subgroup by just examining closure. And this is a logically complete analysis of that. So if you're like C, some odd number, do we just only get um, the two, those two basic subgroups? Like C5, C7, etc. Oh, that's the next section. So, C4, I mean, if you're trying to make me extrapolate what are all possible patterns, I refuse. Uh, C4, um, we have H1, right? In other words, 1a squared, and then below that, there's 1. 
So this is the lattice diagram for this group. Yay. Yes? Hey, if you're trying to do this for just some random group, obviously you a finite group, is this really just the only way to do it? It's just kind of like go case by case by case, look at all the different ways you can possibly combine this bits and then see if it's close? Nope. It is a way, though. I mean, it's the way we have at the moment. We will get better ways in the next section. Yes, yes. Now, I will tell you this much already. So, um, little language. H1 here is the cyclic subgroup generated by A squared. So, we use this notation, bracket, A squared bracket. This is equal to A squared to the K, such that K is an integer. That works out to 1 and A squared for the reasons we just went over. All right. In contrast, C4 is, of course, the cyclic subgroup generated by A, but we also just showed that this cyclic subgroup is generated by, what else? A cubed. A cubed. Yeah. And this is all in the context of C4, right? Like if you're yeah, C, 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 C4 is our, at the moment, token example of a cyclic group. Let me just, while we're on it, I mean, there's no sense in delaying it. What's the definition of a cyclic group? Yeah, definition. Um, G is cyclic group if and only if G is equal to this for some G and G. Where this notation, again, I've defined up here. Oh, I did already in example six of Friday. Hooray! Yes, El Presidente. I'm using the, the finite subgroup test, which says that if I, the subgroup has to be closed under multiplication, right? So if my, I'm starting with what's in black, and then I'm adding possible products by multiplying the black things, either by each other, well, not by each other, but by themselves, because that's all I can do. <laughs> so, I, right, so up here, when I start with A squared, and I try to enlarge the subgroup, it goes back to one, so it's already closed. Here, one and A is not closed, because A times A is A squared, which is not in there already. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> So an interesting and difficult question, one of the things we're after is, you know, what, what, makes, what makes A cubed so different than A squared here? Why is it that A cubed generated C4, whereas A squared didn't, right? <laughs> it will it will remain a mystery for now. <clears throat> uh, definition: If G is a group, I'll try to get to it. But I'll just say the proof of these theorems in words, so we can investigate that question further today. Okay. I need to state these theorems for you guys because they're kind of important. More, more really, I just, this is a definition that we need to know about. Uh, if G is a group, then the center um, of G is Z, because the German for center is like Zentrum or something. Uh, Z of G, which is, let's say X in G, such that XG equals to GX, for all G and G. This is the center of a group. So theorem three, and I, I, I mean, I, maybe I should do it, I don't know. 
I do have another whole day set aside for cyclic groups, so I suppose I don't need to hurry. But uh, Z of G is the subgroup of G, and the center is abelian. Now, the fact that the center is abelian, that's pretty much immediate from the definition of the center, because the center is the, the subset of elements of a group which commute with all other elements. So in particular, it commutes with itself. <laughs> so the fact that the subgroup's abelian is not at all surprising. All right. And the proof, I, I really should actually go through the proof. I, I can't, I, 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 I should resist the uh, curiosity of certain students. Um, so can, how can we prove that that's a, a subgroup? Uh-oh. <laughs> Is it okay? All right. Um, <clears throat> I don't know that it's finite. In fact, the center could be infinite, All right? For example, if you calculate the center of the, um, I'm pretty sure the center of like two by two invertible matrices is any non-zero scalar multiple of the identity matrix. That's an infinite set. So the center doesn't need to be, doesn't need to be finite. So the, the, this finite subgroup test is out. Pretty much we gotta go back and use the, the subgroup test theorem. So we gotta check one, two, three. First of all, it's automatically a subset, so we're good there. By definition, it's a subset of G, right? How about E? Well, EG equal to GE, right? Because they're both equal to G, right? For all G and G. Therefore, E is in the center. One down, right? Two, if X and Y are in the center of G, then if we look at G, X, Y, that's equal to what? That's equal to um, G, X, Y, associativity, right? Which is equal to X, G, Y, because X is in Z, right? X is in the center, so I can commute X and G. But then I can commute G again because y is in the center, right? And admittedly, I'm using associativity all over the place, but we tend not to say we're using associativity at some point because it gets really, really annoying to say by associativity, by associativity, by associativity, by asso it's understood. So, but this shows what? That shows that xy is in the center because it commutes with an arbitrary group element. So that's two. How about three? Let's see here. Assume, assume X is an element of ZG, right? Then um, XG is equal to GX. And if you multiply this by X inverse left and right, I mean, this is true if it only affects inverse XG x inverse is equal to x inverse gx, x inverse, right? Which is equivalent to what? gx inverse equals to x inverse g, which is equivalent to saying x inverse is an element of zg. Now technically I'm missing some qualifiers, right? Here, you guys got me fine. Here, for all G and G, for all G and G, for all G and G, no qualifier needed, by definition. But good try. <laughs> I'm sure associativity is involved in there somehow, so I, 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 won't, I, won't, I won't take it away from you. But there you go, okay, so therefore, Therefore, by subgroup test theorem, what? The center of the group is a subgroup of the group. Okay. So example five, well, I don't know what example it is. In my, in my current lecture, it's example, by my count, four. <laughs> So 
So a couple quick examples here. Example four, you can calculate the center of the symmetric group is just the is just the uh, identity permutation for n greater than or equal to three. All right. So that means that the uh, it's kind of I think it's kind of like a hyperpartisan group, right? It's, it's only one 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 member in the center. Everybody else is as is elsewhere. But there you go, the center of the, uh, and you know, the, the proof of that's relatively simple. Um, we'll, we'll calculate, we'll, we will calculate more centers. Well, here's example five, I'll give you this one for free. If G is abelian, all right, then what's the center of the group equal to? Yeah, the group again, right? Because by definition, an abelian group is one for which any two pairs of elements commute, right? So we have these <laughs> kind of two extremes, right? Permutations, sort of maximally non-abelian in some sense. Yeah. Theorem four, if I have H and K are subgroups of G, then guess what? The intersection of H and K is, again, a subgroup of G. <coughs> so how do, you, how do you prove that? So first of all, if H and K are subgroups of G, right? then E um, is an element of H intersect K as E is an element of H and E is an element of K, right? So the identity is in the intersection because it's in both. One. Two, if you have X and Y are elements of H intersect K, then X and Y are elements of H, and X and Y are elements of K. Actually, I'm going to do two and three at the same time here, because we can. Thus, <clears throat> XY and X inverse are elements of H, and XY and X inverse are elements of K, as H is a subgroup of G, and K is a subgroup of G, right? Which means that they're closed under multiplication and inversion, right? So what's that show? Hence, XY and X inverse are elements of H intersect K, right? So we conclude by the subgroup test theorem that H intersect K is a subgroup of G. Um, Nicholson then looks at um, something called the conjugate of a subgroup and he proves that the conjugate of, a sub, conjugate of a subgroup is again a subgroup of the group. So let me uh, throw that out here. So that's one thing, one way we can create new subgroups from old is to intersect them, right? Um, this is the definition for H, a subgroup of G, define <clears throat> G, H, G inverse, equal to, you guessed it, G, H, G inverse, such that H is in H. So what this is, is the element-wise conjugation of H. All right, theorem. G, H, G inverse is a subgroup of G. And that's for any G and G. <laughs> the 
proof of this is very similar to the, every other proof I've given today. You show the identities in there. Pick two points in there, show the product is in there. Pick a point, show the inverse is in there. It's, again, the proof is by the, by the subgroup test. And then the interesting thing here is this gives us a definition that we will study further in future lectures, which is that if g h g inverse is, is, is equal to h again for all g in g, then h um, is normal subgroup of g. And we write h triangle underline g. So kind of like less than or equal to, but fill in the side. This means normal subgroup. For example, if you're looking at an abelian group, every subgroup is normal. Because g h g inverse amounts to like g plus h minus g, which in the context of an abelian group, you know, think of it as an additive group, the g and the minus g cancel out and you just get back what you started again. So in an abelian group, conjugation is kind of boring. Now, Nicholson has a nice example where he shows you that g h g inverse need not be h again in S3. He shows you that, he, he shows a subgroup of S3 which is not normal, all right? So I'll let you read that. We will come back to the idea of normal subgroups later. We're just whoo, throwing it out there now. Okay, so moving along here. Ooh, I did have a nice example of subgroup, but I think I'll save it for another day. And I think what I'd like to do with the time that remains is try to look at just an example in a little bit more depth. Kind of like example three, but let's pick on something a little bit bigger. And let's do an additive example instead of a multiplicative one, okay? So this, this th that's pretty much all I have to say about the subgroups. Uh, uh, section. I mean, I have another example of subgroups that I want to share with you guys, but uh, maybe I'll save that for another day. Um, um, let's see here. Where are my example? Six. Thanks. Let's look at Z20. This is probably a bad choice, but let's look at Z20. So this is an additive group, right? And um, I mean, what is Z20? Uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Why didn't I pick something smaller? 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. I regret this. 17, 18, 19. OK, there we go. We can count. Those, those, <laughs> those, most, those most certainly should not have bars. <laughs> Take it back. <laughs> Them's fighting words. Now, obviously, so like here, if you look at this notation, if, if I say J like this, what's that mean? This means NJ, well, let's say, excuse me, it means, it means JK such that other way around, sorry. Kj such that k is an integer. So, you know, contrast that with, with g equal to g to the k such that k is an integer. I mean, the cyclic group generated by g is different when you look at an additive versus multiplicative context. By the way, the words I just use, cyclic group generated by g, next lecture, we prove that that's valid. That in fact, this is a group automatically. <laughs> this forms a group automatically. I mean, you can almost see it. 
by laws of exponents. But anyway. So here, that means this, this is multiple notation, right? So that means we add j to itself k fold times, right? So this is, this is just a notation for j plus j plus j plus da 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 plus j k fold times, right? So what are some subgroups? I mean, this is a finite group, so it has finite subsets. We can use the subgroup, the, the, the subgroup test theorem to look for subsets, right? What are some subgroup, subsets? Zero. <laughs> Zero. <laughs> okay, thank you. Obligatory, yeah, Z20. Okay, now that we get that out of our system, what are some interesting subgroups? Here, how about this one? The subgroup generated by 10, which has 0 and uh, 10, and that's it. Like hmm. five, like if you did five, ten, oh, five, I like that five. What's five, five give us? Five is zero, five, ten, fifteen, right? So if it's relatively prime, is, do you get <laughs> I don't know, it's a mystery. Let's see here, so, uh, I, I, I know, I'm just trying to stay ignorant. I'm trying to discover things <laughs> through this example. We have to make Samuel start wearing like a spoiler alert hat or something. I don't know. Let's see here. Ah, uh, yeah. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. So, what else is this? What if we? What? What if we? Would this be the same as ten? Oh no, it's not, right? But that—that's not true, right? But is this the same as fifteen? So that's what fifteen, thirty, forty-five, and then sixty, <laughs> right? Which is again. Uh, 15, 10, um, 5, and 0, right? So for this subgroup, we can either generate it by 5 or by 15, but not by 10. That's interesting. And then, what would you guys say, 4 maybe? What would that, that be 0, 4, 8, 12, 16, there you go. What else will generate? What else can we use as the generator for this? So you think eight? This will also be generated by eight, twelve, and sixteen. That's a guess. Let's just well let's, let's work it out. Eight plus. I mean, do it. What's eight? Zero. Eight. Sixteen. Twenty-four. Um, 32, 40. Oh, now we're back to zero again. So what is that? Zero, eight, 16, four, 12, zero. Yeah, it's the same. I'm not going to try to say something like that. So, <clears throat> I mean, I'm not saying you can't say something like that, but I refuse to Say what you're saying at the moment. I have my reasons. Two. <laughs> so two is the even, right? It's zero, two, four, six, blah, 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 blah. And so then, we, 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 we will come to specific, and I mean, we're probably going to say what you just said, Sam, next lecture. That's why I'm resisting, because hopefully we're saying it and proving it next time. But. So then the question, of course, is what else will generate that subgroup? <coughs> 6, you say 6, 14, and 18. But not, but not, uh, well, 2 is the generator, obviously, right? But 4 can't be what we're looking, I mean, we already know that 4 is out, 8 is out, 10 is out, and 12 is out, and 16 is out, why? Because those are generators of one of these guys, right? Are there any other subgroups? What's that? I 
Oh, oh, you're, now you're, you're getting back to Z20 itself. So Z20, um, yeah, right, that's generated by one. What else is it generated by? Yeah, I mean, that is the truth. It, so any number relatively prime to 20 will generate, will generate Z20. So 1, 3, 7, 9, 9, 11, 13, 17, and 19. Those are all generators of Z20. Let's draw the lattice of subgroups and then we'll call it a day. How about that? I thought this might be nice to have an actual example of lattice subgroup that wasn't just stupidly trivial, right? I mean, both he introduces this concept of a lattice of subgroups and he gives, he gives you two examples in this section. It's like, can I, could I have a little bit more to go on maybe? If you're going to ask me homework questions about it, right? So here we go. We got Z20. And then what's... What's, what's the, it um, uh, looks like we got, I think we've got, um, uh, yeah, two, right? Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. Poor planning on my part. In other words, I mean, the two cannot be fit inside the five or vice versa, right? They're this, and then what do we have? Ah, yowzers. But beneath here is four, right? I think, because it's got all this, right? <laughs> oh yeah, 10 is, 10 is down here. And then what? Ow. Yowzers. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, is this a subgroup of that? Okay, then yes. This is not a very good picture, but, uh, and I think <laughs> beneath these is just zero, right? I'm sorry? Oh, yeah, I mean, and, and then honestly, some people will just write zero, but there, I mean, angle brackets are easier, why not? Yeah. Indeed, the cyclic subgroup generated by the multiplicative identity is just the multiplicative identity. The cyclic subgroup generated by a zero is just zero. Yeah. And there you have it. And that, so, I mean, the, so the, I know you guys are wanting to ask me the question, like, how do you find the lattice of subgroups? I don't have a nice answer to that. The answer is you have to come to an understanding of what are all possible subgroups of the group and how they fit together. But we'll be discovering nice facts about those which force you to do certain things based on just counting. Like you'll notice these, the size of the subgroups, two, four, five, and, and 10, right? Those, it's no accident those are all divisors of 20, right? In fact, we proved hopefully next class that the subgroup of a cyclic group has to have order which divides the order of the group. Anyway, I shut up. Thanks, guys.